Goranga. <clears throat> we will sing Bhakti Vinoda, I mean, Bhakti Siddhanta is one of his favorite songs. He had two or three favorite songs, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada and Yaso Mati Nandana. These were his two favorite songs, so I'll sing Sri Yaso Mati Nandana. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know the words, find them somewhere or listen very carefully. <laughs> Yaso mati nandana braja padana gura gokul ranjana kahan hayasam Yaso mati nandana braja padana gura Kokul Ranjana Kahan Hayasam Kokul Ranjana Gopi Parandandanam Madham Manohara Gopi Parandana Madhaman Hohara Kali Adamon Habidhaharam Kali Adamon Habidhaharam Hamala Hadin Ham, Hamia Vilhasa Ham. Hamala Hadin Ham, Hamia Vilhasa Ham. Vipin of poor and hard and Vamsi Vadarasu Vahasai Naminan Vamsi Vadarasu Hey, Vajran of Fallen Sudakulan Hasantam Vajrajana fallen Sura cool han ha san ha San han ha gur han na rakku ha 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 San han ha gur han na rakku ha 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 Go in the mud hub, never need to task her. Go in the mud hub, never need to task Sundharananda Gopalal Hey, Jamuna Tatta Chara Hupi Vasanohara Jamuna Tatta Chara Gopi Vasanohara Rasya Rasika Kripa Mohoya Rasya Rasika Kripa Mohoya 
Hey, see out of all of us, Vindavan and not the party. Hey, see out of all of us, Vindavan and not the party. Bhakti Vinora Sahaya. Sila Bhakta TV no Asraya Hey Asomati Nanana Vajibara Nagara Kukul Ranjana Khan Asom Vajibara Hey Kukul Ranjana Hamala Hari Nam, Hamia Vila Saham Govinda Madhavan, Havanita Taskaram Sri Radhavala Vindavan and Hattavaram Hari Bho, Hari Bho, Hari Bho, Kaur Hari Bho Nam Jaya Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Jaya Pancha Tadva Jaya Bhakti Siddhanta Jaya Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta Jaya Prabhupada 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 Prabhu Pan, Jaya Jaya Prabhu Pan Yasamati Nandana Prajabara Nagara Gokula Ranjana Kahana When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was departing the world, he requested two songs to be sung. This one we just sang, known as Nama Kirtana, and uh, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada. These were his two most uh, favorite of all bhajans. So we want to take the opportunity to glorify him by singing Harinam. These are all beautiful names of Krishna and Sri Vrindavan. Krishna has many names due to his many activities. So these are really enchant the heart and mind when we hear these beautiful, beautiful names. So I'll speak a little bit about his appearance and then I'll read a few of his statements regarding principles of devotional life, which may be points of discussion. Om Gyan Timirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Neya Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pestaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Tinamine Panchakalpa Tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaho Namaha 
Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So I was just listening a little bit to Srila Prabhupada speak about his Guru Maharaj just before coming over. And Prabhupada was narrating the history a little bit of Lord Chaitanya's movement. And he mentions that when things are started, a lot of times due to the influence of time, which is the one of the deteriorating factors of the material energy, things go down. So after the disappearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, Practically, his movement was lost for about 150 years. But what came back after that time was just a series of uh, groups claiming to be a followers of Lord Chaitanya. Ao, Bao, Jad Goswami, Shine, Saki Beti, Nagari, Nityananda Vapsa, uh, uh, Jad Goswami, yeah, so many different groups. And 13 were primarily, and they were all asampradayas. <clears throat> that means they had no connection with Lord Chaitanya, and simply surreptitiously adopted that position of being followers of Lord Chaitanya, and they were twisting and adding material principles to spiritual practices sometimes even sinful principles. So Bhakti Thakur appeared in, in the beginning of the 1800s. Oh, no, actually around the middle of the 1800s, around the 1830s. And uh, he, after reading the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he was a Shakta before, followers of the energies of the Lord, you know, with those who worship Durga, and, various energies. But after coming across uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, he completely changed and understood that here was the truth of religious principles in the life and teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he worked to propagate, started many societies, and started to teach the principles of Lord Chaitanya. But then again, he was always in opposition with all of these groups. Um, after some time, he realized that he needed the Lord's personal help before we, he could actually make any difference in spreading and bringing about, again, Lord Chaitanya's genuine movement. So he prayed to the, for, to the Lord directly, please send me someone from your personal entourage to um, help bring about Lord Chaitanya's teachings. But he never recognized, he never realized until after that it was his own son that was that answer to the prayer. So in uh, 1874, at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon on the date of February 6th, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, whose name at that time was Bhimala Prashad, the fifth son of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he appeared in the world. At that time, um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur was living in Jagannath Puri. You can still go and see the house, but it's no longer a house, it's actually a, a huge temple now. It's been transformed into a temple with deities and regular worship. And it's a pretty spacious place. You can. You can go there with hundreds of people and do kirtan. Um, so he was living there, and he was also the magistrate, or the one of the main uh, organizers of the affairs of the Jagannath Temple. He was given that, jo that job. And uh, he was so successful at it, at it that he was respected as the leader of the organizing of the worship, and all of the, everything that went on in relationship to Lord Jagannath. 
So, but at one time, of course, he had to leave at different times, leave in Jagannath Puri to go on business. So one time there was the Ratha Yantra, and Prabhupada describes how Bhakti, little Bhakti Siddhanta Bhimala Prashad was only six months old. That was in July of the same year he was born. And the Jagannath cart was going down Grand Road, which is right past the house of Bhakti Vinod. And it stopped right in front of the house. And so his wife, Bhagavati Devi, who was very respectable, being the wife of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was allowed to go onto the cart along with her child, who was only six months old. And uh, she placed the child at the feet of Lord Jagannath. <laughs> and as soon as she did that, a garland, one of the garlands, there were many garlands on Jagannath, fell off and landed all around him in a circle. <laughs> so everyone was amazed and thought, oh, well, this is also, you know, good, good luck, good fortune. And then when she told her husband upon returning, that incident convinced him that that prayer that he made to the Lord was the answer, an answer in the form of his son. So then he took very, very good care to make sure his son grew up nicely and got everything he needed. And of course, we saw the child, how he developed. <clears throat> when he was born, uh, Prabhupada talks about this too, the, it's called the umbilical cord, which connects the mother to the child from navel to navel. Um, when he came out, the umbilical cord was wrapped around him like a Brahmin thread. <laughs> So that was never seen before. So the Lord wanted to show that this person is, you know, he's a Mahapurush. He's not coming in this world simply to take birth on the, under karma like we all do, but he's actually sent by the Lord to do this work. And all good signs were there at the time of the child's birth. <clears throat> so with much care was given. And the child was very, grew up quite fast and was able to develop good intelligence even at a young age. There was an incident when he was four years old where he went into the deity room and took the, de the mango that was to be offered to the deity and he ate it. <laughs> and so his father said, oh, you have committed a big offense. This is not good. This is this 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 was belongs to the deity. And he took it very seriously, so seriously that he vowed his whole life never to eat mangoes. And you might say, well, that's not so hard. That's if you're living in Slovenia. <laughs> but if you're living in India during mango season, whew, it's tough. Because the mangoes are the most sought after fruit. It comes in May of every year. And when when the season is really good, the mangoes are big, sweet, juicy. And people use mangoes for everything. They'll use mango chutney, mango drinks, mangoes, mango in making different kinds of foodstuffs. But he remained strict his whole life. And people would give him mangoes and he would say, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept, I'm a fender. So he followed that his whole life, never at once ever taking a mango. But there was no offense for a four-year-old child, obviously, but still, he considered it, you know, something serious. And of course, he grew up and his father taught him a lot. And by the age of seven, he memorized the whole Bhagavad Gita when he was seven years old. He also was worshipping Lord Nishringa. His father gave him a Nishringa mantra to worship. And the child was chanting Japa and showing great signs of great intelligence. And he was a very obedient and very simple child. Not naughty like children are when they grow up. And uh, as he grew up, he showed more and more signs of greatness 
fact, when he was 11 years old, he created his own system of shorthand. You know what shorthand is? Shorthand is that when the secretaries who work for you know people in business, the secret the businessmen dictate, and the secretaries have to write. Of course, now we have computers, but before people would write in these codes, and it's a system of codes, yeah. Yeah, I heard it's a system Yeah, what is it called? It's graphia. Stenographia, yeah. Yeah, how to write in codes, right? And then it's, it's, it's a short way of writing what is being said. So he, he developed his own style of that. <laughs> he created it, which is quite ingenious for a child at 11 years old. <laughs> he, was a, he would love to read. He loved to worship the deity. He loved to chant. But he was mostly interested in reading, reading, reading. So whenever he got a chance, he would read as much books. He would read the works of his father, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And then later on, when he entered into school, he wouldn't even go to the classes. He would spend all day in the, in the library. And he would read, in fact, he'd read every book in the library. <laughs> And Prabhupada would say about his spiritual master, he was a, a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> In other words, whatever he read, whatever he heard, he remembered. <laughs> he had what they call it, it's called Shruti Dara. Shruti Dara means one who never forgets anything they hear. <laughs> so this is how sharp his mind was. Um, when he was in university, college, he, create, he started a society called the August Society, August something. And um, that society, if you, in order to join it, you had to take a lifelong vow of celibacy. <laughs> he was thinking at that even when he was in college. But not too many people joined his society. I think he was the only one. <laughs> and so his parents never tried to get him married because they understood that this wasn't at all his destiny. So he grew up in a very amazing way. Um, I'll read a few of the things that uh, he wrote. And then I'll, make, I'll say one more little pastime. These are statements that are called Upadeshavali. And these are 24 statements about principles of devotional service. And a lot of it's about the holy name. So he says, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam, supreme victory to the congregational chanting of the Holy Name. This is the Gaudiya Ma's sole object of worship. <laughs> so he wanted to make that point that chanting of the Holy Name is our main object of worship. Sri Krishna, who is Visaya Vigraha, or the object of the devotee's love, is the sole enjoyer, and all others are, are to be enjoyed by him. So we understand that we are Prakriti, and Krishna is the only Purusha. Prakriti means one who is enjoyed, and Purusha means one who is the enjoyer. So Krishna expands himself into his own himself, into various manifestations of himself, in order to exchange love with himself. <laughs> you can't have love unless there's two. And Krishna's love is so great that he expands himself into unlimited forms that are of himself, but are in a lesser position of himself to exchange love. And so it's the duty and the happiness and the success of the living entities who are parts of the Krishna to try to make Krishna happy. 
Uh, you, we see in modern day religious society, everyone wants God to make them happy, right? So they pray to God, they petition God, they do different things in order to get something from God, in order to be happy or to be successful or whatever. But that is not our focus. Our focus is to think how to make Krishna happy. <laughs> that is our focus. And as uh, Srila Prabhupada would say, when the cowherd boys were with Krishna and Vrindavan, um, they would always look into Krishna's lunch pail to see what Mother Yasoda made for Krishna that day. <laughs> so, Prabhupada says that in modern religion, people pray, my Lord, give me my daily bread. But devotees pray, my dear Lord, what would you like to eat today? <laughs> what can I make for you that would make you happy? <laughs> So that is bhakti, as opposed to karma. Karma means trying to get something from Krishna by worshiping Krishna. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, here then, this is number three. Those who don't perform Hari Bhajan are ignorant and murderers of their own soul. Strong. The acceptance of Hari Nam and direct realization of Bhagavan are one and the same. <laughs> so to realize God and to accept Harinam is the same. So Harinam is the highest form of expression of devotion which brings about realization of Krishna. So you can't get anything higher. So when I see the devotees every day going out on Harinam, I feel so happy. <laughs> I wish I could join you every day, and I try to think about how to do that. But I will, but it is because we know that Harinam Sankirtan is nothing higher and more direct because when we do it in our temples, we benefit. But when we do it outside, so many people benefit. And that's Lord Chaitanya's desire is to give this mercy in the form of Harinam Sankirtan to the world. <laughs> so anyone who does that is immediately recognized by Lord Chaitanya. And that recognition means one will make nice adv advancement on the path of devotional service. Um, I'll skip some of them and try to go to the ones that I like. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's fair or not. <laughs> If we desire to follow an auspicious course in life, then disregarding the theories of countless people, we should hear instructions only from a transcendental source. And so sometimes people like to go to other sources to get knowledge about Krishna or devotional life. But these sources are not qualified because as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would say, it's like licking the outside of the bottle of honey and trying to taste the honey. Because these people who present themselves as spiritualists and don't practice properly, or don't practice at all, sometimes they're just study scriptures to be famous for knowledge of scripture. They have some interest, but their desire is personal name and fame. They have no adhikari. They have no ability to change anyone's life towards Krishna consciousness. You have to be following in order to affect others. And that's important. And he also mentions that in another one here. Uh, where is it? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, he says, preaching... This is another one. Preaching without following proper conduct falls in the category of karma or mundane activity. Without criticizing the nature of other, one should correct oneself. This is my 
personal instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is what is called sadachar and there is prachar. Sadachar is proper etiquette and behavior. And prachar is your words, your sp what you speak. So if sadachar is not there, prachar doesn't have much effect. <laughs> It may sound good, and some people may be, what we say, affected by that. But generally, because, as it says, there's a saying, I think in English, uh, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions speak louder than your words. <laughs> yeah, so an example, as they also say, example is higher than precept. What you speak only has effect, and you know, a real effect, when you live according to what you are speaking. At least up to a certain standard. And there's people who like to speak but don't like to follow, and therefore they don't really have much effect either for themselves or for others. So yeah, um, and Sanatana Goswami, he glorified Srila Haridas Thakur when he said that some people, they preach, but their conduct is not so good. And others, they don't preach, but their conduct is ideal. <laughs> he said, you are the best in both categories. You Not only are you preaching, but your behavior is supreme, the best. So when we combine these two, that is, that is, that is called acharya. The word acharya means to one who teaches by example. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's another one. The foot dust of Srila Rupa Goswami, the fulfiller of Lord Chaitanya Deva's inner desire, is our life's sole desired object. So that was Bhakti Siddhanta really, really glorified Rupa Goswami in many ways. So here, because Rupa Goswami was very, very close to and understood the mind of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is not so easy. <laughs> very few, even of his followers, could understand his mind. But Srila Rupa Goswami had uh, understood his mind quite, quite clearly and therefore Bhakti Siddhanta says, to be a follower of Rupa Goswami is our goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. He says, if I were to desist, you know what desist means, right? Desist means to stop. If I were to stop from lecturing about the absolute truth, due to being fearful that some listeners may be displeased, I would be deviating from the path of Vedic truth and accepting the path of untruth. Hmm. Yeah, he was strong. And Prabhupada tells the story how when he saw all of these other groups who were not following but claiming to be followers, he spoke out, especially against the Kasko Swamis. The Kasko Swamis, the Kas Brahmins, Kasko Swamis, means that by birth, you designate what you are, but not by qualification. But our understanding is that if you're born in Brahman, and but you're not following Brahminical principles and acting accordingly, you're giving a, a definition according to what you're doing, not by what your birth is. So, therefore, one has to live according to the principles that they aspire for. So here, he's saying, of course, that he was attacking these, and Prabhupada goes on to say that he was relentless, that means he never stopped exposing deviations in philosophical teachings, so much so that, I was just listening to Prabhupada speak this tonight, he was saying that these uh, Brahmins and others, they got together as a group and they made a plan to kill Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. <clears throat> and so they went to the police chief and said that, you know, we want to do something against Bhakti Siddhanta. 
we will give you 25,000 rupees. Now, 25,000 rupees in those days is not like 25,000 rupees today. <laughs> that was, that's practically like $25,000. Know. It's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, they said, well, here is it. And the police chief said, well, we do engage in such activities, but I cannot accept because he is a saintly person. So the police chief refused to take the bribe. And then he went to Bhakti Sadat and said, you better take care, there are, there are men out to cause you harm. So then, of course, uh, they were unsuccessful. <coughs> But that's how strong his preaching was, that he was being threatened and uh, criticized for speaking the truth. But he says here, uh, it, uh, if I were to stop from lecturing about the absolute truth due to being fearful that some listeners may, not, may be displeased, I would be deviating from the path of Vedic truth and accepting the path of untruth. I would become one who is inimical to the Vedas, an atheist, and would no longer possess faith in the Lord, the very embodiment of all truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's our duty, especially those who are preachers, but everyone, when we see and hear deviations, we should very carefully point these things out. Um, his Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master, was very enthusiastic. He was very kind by nature and very open. But when it came to philosophical deviations, philosophical presentations that were off, Srila Prabhupada was very strong and very quick to make the corrections. Not only to make to set things right, but to not allow deviations to exist because once you deviate, then you deviate. In other words, deviation leads to deviation, <laughs> which leads to more deviation. So once you accept something wrong, then everything then it's easy to continue to go in that same direction. <laughs> That's why Srila Prabhupada wanted to keep our movement very strong. When people were challenging, you know, the four regulative principles, Prabhupada was never, would never compromise that principle. He said, to be a follower of our movement, you have to chant 16 rounds, follow four regulative principles. Everything else below that means you're aspiring to be a follower. You're not following yet. So those, that is the standard or foundation for practicing the Krishna conscious. Chanting 16 rounds and following four regulative principles. That's the, that's the bottom line. If you're below that, you're not faulty, but you're not up to the standard. So come up to the standard. That's the idea. So here's what you have to aspire for. No one should criticize you if you're below the standard. But at the same time, you should understand, I still have to come to that standard. And then I can practice Krishna consciousness easily and get the mercy of the Lord. Because the mercy of the Lord comes in his instructions. When people ask for mercy, you get instructions. <laughs> that is the mercy. Okay. Krishna's darshan can only be attained through the medium of the ear. As one hears Harikatha from pure Vaishnavas, there is no other way. <laughs> so this is also, this is how we connect through the process of hearing. <laughs> Wherever Harikatha is being spoken, that is a holy place. <laughs> That's a good one. Wherever, in other words, holy places sometimes are seen as designated places, such as temples or holy places. But wherever Harikata is being regularly spoken, that place is a holy place. So if you're living 
in a home outside and Harikatha is a regular thing, that is a tirtha, that is a holy place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should understand that the loud calling of Krishna's name is bhakti. <laughs> okay, that's it, that's all. By sincerely endeavoring to chant Harinam without offense and remaining fixed and chanting constantly, one's offenses will fade and pure Harinam will arise on the tongue. Hmm. So you want to be successful in chanting? Just keep chanting. <laughs> Even if it's not tasteful, it will become tasteful after some time. Even if the mind is disturbed by other thoughts, continue because the process works. It's like if you have a disease and maybe you don't like the medicine, but still the medicine is the cure. Keep taking the medicine and following the doctor's instructions and then the disease will, will, will go. So the medicine is asadi enechi asadi maya nasi badalagi hari nama maha mantra lao tu mi magi. This is the medicine. This age, chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. Okay, and then the last one, which is somewhat connected to this one, it says, as mundane thoughts arise while taking Harinam, so while you're chanting, mundane thoughts come into mind, you should not become discouraged, he says. A secondary consequence of taking Harinam is that these useless mundane thoughts will gradually go. Therefore, one should not worry about this. By dedicating one's mind, body, and words and serving Srinam and continuing to chant with great persistence, Srinam Prabhu will grant one's darshan of the supremely auspicious transcendental form, of his supremely auspicious transcendental form. So by chanting and gradually chant more and more, one will, Krishna will reveal his transcendental form to you. And by counting to chant until one's anarthas are fully eradicated by the power of the name, realization of his form, qualities, and pastimes will automatically arise. So everything begins from, develops on, and ends in Harinam. <laughs> so sometimes we get confused, we think that, how can I figure out this Krishna consciousness? You don't have to. Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and try to avoid the offenses. That's, that's the essence of Krishna conscious practice. If we're chanting with offense, try to chant without offense, but don't give up chanting in any condition like that. Okay, so these are some of his uh, statements regarding process of devotional service. I, I mentioned a few of them. I like that. And um, there's much to be said about Bhakti Siddhanta. I think I'm scheduled to give class tomorrow night and I'll add more uh, information that, about Bhakti Siddhanta tomorrow night. I want to spend two days on him because I don't think just going through one day really quickly is enough to really honor this great personality. I think he's worth, <laughs> you can speak about him every day, actually. <laughs> he's the most interesting personality you could possibly meet. His life is fascinating and very, very amazing. It's, kind of, it's, it's completely transcendental. Because he's, as we said, he's not a person that came to this world out of karma. He was sent by the Lord to do this work. So when we say that it was Bhakti Siddhanta actually who took Krishna's, to, who wanted Krishna's name to go all around the world. <laughs> Bhakti Vinod Thakur had the desire. Bhakti Siddhanta actually started to make it happen. 
by sending his devotees to different Western countries, such as London, Germany, uh, what was known as, uh, what is called Mayanar now, it's called Mayanar, Burma, it was formerly called Burma. Um, and then, of course, um, there was other places, but out of all those persons who went, they came back with very little or no success, but it was our Srila Prabhupada who was thinking, you know, my, my god brothers, they failed in European countries, but let me go to a new place and fail there, so I'll try New York. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, I was dreaming of going to New York. He wasn't thinking I was going to be successful, but he said, let me try. <laughs> let me try. He said, when I was, I would tell them, you have to chant the names of the Lord and you have to give up illicit sexual activity. You have to give up intoxication, including tea and coffee. You have to give up eating meat, fish, eggs, garlic, onions, and you have to give up all gambling, including frivolous sports, they will say to me, Swamiji, go home. <laughs> but let me try. <laughs> so he tried, and he was successful. He was empowered. So our Srila Prabhupada, you know, taking the Instructions of his Guru Maharaja's his life and soul. Yes, ya Devi para bhaktir, yata Devi tata guru, tasyaita kartite yarta, prakasananta mahatmanaha. Those who have not faith, but that faith that's not broken under any circumstance, in the instructions of the Lord and his pure devotee, the spiritual master, all the imports of all Vedic knowledge becomes revealed in the heart of that devotee. In other words, you know everything you need to know to go back home, back to Godhead. Simply if you have complete faith in Guru and Krishna, that means faith that is never changed by circumstance. Because <laughs> sometimes we have faith, but then circumstances challenge our faith and our faith goes less or even goes goes away completely just like sometimes people say well why is god allowing this to happen why is god doing this to me why is god here's a nice person why is god making that person suffer and sometimes people lose faith because either for what's happening to them or what's happening to somebody they know but Implicit faith means complete faith. It's called strata. That faith, it's not broken under any condition. <laughs> Even life-threatening. <laughs> okay. So, I'll uh, conclude there. Yeah? You want to ask a question? Well, they, don't have, they don't have tea to eat, and I just don't know why we don't have special Prabhupada's purpose. Well, uh, well, Prabhupada was understanding that tea is also an intoxicant. Well, when you have these herbal teas, they seem to be outside of the category. They call them teas, but they're really herbal drinks, really. When you use the word tea, it has a certain connotation. But actually, they're herbal beverages, herbal... Pepper means it's okay, but we, like here, a lot of time it's Praninsky chai and some other types of teas that are half fermented. The tea helps the in me. Well, anything that's, that's in, that can cause intoxication but it's, it's is... 
Yeah, we do. Well, then present your arguments to the GBC and see what they say. <laughs> I'm not a devotee, I'm not initiated, I just try to become devotee. Well, we, we respect your opinion, but then and again there is some discussion about whether, you know, what is tea and what is not tea. Mm -hmm. Then you have to decide. If it's actually an intoxicant, that's the point. Because coffee has caffeine, which we know is a, is a mild intoxicant, sometimes even not so mild. And, but you see, Prabhupada saw, and this is also mentioned, that when the British brought tea to India, people became addicted to drinking tea. It became an addiction, just like you get addicted to a drug. They had to have their tea. In fact, Prabhupada had a personal experience with his own wife that, you know, her tea and her tea biscuits were more important than her husband. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, well, well let's see if there, yeah, just hold your question for one minute. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to you. But, you know, you should understand that it's not so easy to just to say, well, all fermented drinks or tea, and therefore we should follow Prabhupada. You should have to, you have to know, and carefully discuss this with people who know more about this. I, I half agree with you, but there are what we say, uh, what we say, uh, herbal beverages that go in the name of teas. You know, that are not, you know, tea. But they give that name tea because it it looks like tea, <laughs> like that. Okay, anyone else? Did, did you get the an yeah yeah I I I understand, but the idea of questions is to understand the answers. <laughs> so. Bhakti, of course, means devotion. Yeah. Siddhanta means the conclusion or the end of devotion. In other words, the topmost devotion. Siddhanta means the the final. Bhakti Siddhanta means the the highest principle of devotion. And Thakur refers to a person who is f completely on the transcendental platform. And so he said. Okay, because we have we have Bhakti Vinod Thakur, we have Haridas Thakur, like that. Hmm. Hare Krishna, thank you. Yeah, anything else? No comments or questions. Okay. All right, so we'll stop here and uh, we'll continue a little bit tomorrow with the same subject matter. Thank you. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj Ki Jai. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hare Krishna.